<laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to our hangout today. This is Michelle Bukanski Brock. I'm the community coordinator of the center and we have a very exciting event here for you today. I'm so excited that so many of you have RSVP'd and agreed to participate and watch us live today in this uh, hangout on air. The center is a new community that has been brought to you by At One. Um, and what the goal of the center is, is to leverage the, the power, the potential of social media to bring together, to connect um, all the educators in California's 112 community colleges, bring us together and help us share and learn and collaborate with uh, one another um, more effectively. And so that's one of the things that we are here to do today. And the way that we make this happen in the center, since there's probably a lot of people watching today for the first time, and we're hoping that you're going to share the archive of today's Hangout with lots more people, because we know you're going to be so dazzled by all the great things that you learn in the next 30 minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, um, one of the things that, that, that or how we do that in the center is we, we, have, um, we establish topics. We establish topics that are important that, that um, educators in California's community colleges are talking about that we think that we could learn more deeply from if we come together and share in community. And um, we do that through Hangouts on Air, which is what you're watching right now. The Hangouts are live video conversations that are streamed openly online um, between a small group of people and um, anyone can ask questions through Twitter. And so if you're watching live right now, you can ask questions by sending a tweet and including the hashtag CCCLearn in your tweet. I'll say that again, CCCLearn. If you include that in your tweet, then you can go, um, that, we'll be watching that, um, that back channel throughout the, the um, Hangout, and any questions that you have, I'll be moderating that. We can weave them into the conversation. The other thing that we do is every other Thursday at 3 o'clock p.m. Pacific, we have a Twitter chat. We had our first one last week, and it was pretty fabulous. We had a nice, um, steady group of educators join us in a conversation about becoming a connected educator, and uh, we'll be holding a Twitter chat in relation to this Hangout next Thursday. So we do a Hangout and then a Twitter chat all around the same topic. And so the Twitter chat's a conversation to jump online and to, to share resources, ideas, reflections, questions about what happened in the Hangout. Um, and really kind of grow your network with educators across the state. And so it's really fun because you get connected with people that you didn't know were out there. And it's, it's a, just a really fun way to use Twitter uh, to really promote your own professional development. So our next Twitter chat will be on Thursday, October 31st at 3 p.m. on Halloween. So we're all going to dress up and we can even tweet um, <laughs> pictures of our costumes. It'll be really fun. Um, and on the screen here, you see how you can follow us on Twitter at center underscore ed. And you also see the link to our Google Plus uh, community, okay? If you go to our Google Plus community and become a member or, and or if you follow us on Twitter, that's how you'll receive regular updates about the Hangouts and the Twitter chat. So please do both if, if you can, um, or definitely at least one. At the bottom of the screen, there's a new URL that I hope you're going to write down um, or maybe even open in another window on your screen so you can, can use it later on today, tiny.cc slash center topics. It's a really simple, just open-ended question where you can go in and just submit a topic for um, something that you want to see talked about uh, in the center. Um, the center, we want it to be very community-driven, bottom-up. That's what makes a community a community. And so we need to hear from you, and we are listening. I've got my ear to the ground, and I'm really looking for input. So um, let me know what it is that's important to you and what you think would be valuable to have conversations about with other educators from around the state. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to be quiet now. I've got a couple more announcements that I'm going to hold off until the end. But now we're going to get started with our topic for today, which is Supersize the online learning sweet spot. This is <laughs> such a fun one. And I have two fabulous people that I'm going to introduce you to now. 
I've got Katie Palacios and Sam Hurst, um, and they're both from the San Diego Community College District. And I'm going to um, first pass it over to Katie and then over to Sam and let them introduce themselves to you. Sure. Hi, everybody. Katie Palacios. I'm an instructional designer for the San Diego Community College District, so um, I'll get into a little bit about what that means in a second here. But uh, working with City College, Miramar Mesa, and continuing ed faculty. Sam? Hi, everybody. I'm Sam Hurst. I'm an adjunct professor of anthropology at San Diego Mesa College, which is one of the colleges within the district. I've been teaching online since about 2005. I absolutely adore this medium for teaching simply because it's so challenging and um, so engaging with students when you find the right tools. And that's why we're excited to talk to you about what we've got in store for you today. I couldn't agree more, Sam. Um, that passion is so important and to believe in what you're doing. So, Katie, let's go back to you. A minute ago you said you're going to share with us a little bit about what you do. So, um, I know from experience that not all community colleges um, have instructional designers. So, why don't we start there and just, if you could take a moment to share with us what it is that an instructional designer does kind of what you're, you know, what you're tasked with, what it is that you do, and then just kind of transition into what this model is that you've developed that you're going to share with us and why you developed it, you know, where you saw the need and, and how it came about. Sure. So um, as an instructional designer for our district, I work with faculty who are teaching online or who are what we call web enhancing courses. So they're using Blackboard or LMS or other technologies um, in their courses. So hopefully it means that I get to work with them to develop um, and design learning experiences. That's the fun instructional design piece. Um, but a lot of times it also means Blackboard support, uh, questions, how-tos, um, you know, troubleshooting stuff as well. So it means um, I get to, um, you know, do workshops with faculty, have, um, we've got a training course that we have that we offer online to faculty um, that I help to manage and design, and then also doing one-on-one -on -one kind of coaching with folks who come into our lab or I meet them on site at their campus. Um, and it might just be, you know, I'm teaching face-to-face -face and how do I move this online or how do I, what should I do with this assignment, it's not working or there's a whole range of things uh, that I'm working with faculty on but I'll transition into this online, the super size, our, our uh, sweet spot here, that's when stuff gets fun and, and I'm going to share my screen in order to do that. So You probably have a minor in psychology too, right? <laughs> My, well, cognitive science, so, but yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> so it's not so much a model or a framework. I think that sounds like really official and I don't know what those kind of words cause me to start yawning a little bit. So uh, instead, just think uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's, it's the peanut butter and jelly sandwich of active learning. And... Um, so what happens is, right, I sit down with a faculty member and I begin, we, we did begin to just start talking about designing their online course. And what I find is that oftentimes when first transitioning from face-to-face -to, -face to online, we tend to compartmentalize our online course into these three separate areas, um, content assessment and interaction. So they are, they are some overlap, but kept mostly separate um, and, you know, we think, okay, content, we have to choose a textbook, um, a textbook publisher provides additional materials, let's say PowerPoint files, activities on the web, their website, other support materials, right? Maybe we've got lecture note content that we provide, um, but, you know, we upload that to the LMS and boom, okay, cool, content is done. Assessment. Let's say our publisher provides us with these awesome test banks we can import directly onto our LMS. Awesome. Quizzes and tests are taken care of. We design a paper. Students write for their final uh, project, let's say, and then assessment. Cool. is done. And then finally we move on to interaction and here it is at the end of our design. Okay, wait, we got to put some interaction into this online course. That's a requirement, right? So let's post a few discussion board topics and um, 
pose those to our students and their interaction check. So, I mean, that's a huge oversimplification. I know there's so much more to it. But you see it's easy to compartmentalize that course design into those three separate areas. And I think we probably do that. I find that the faculty member, I mean, we're coming from the face-to-face -face paradigm. So it's kind of easy to see those separate, those separate pieces of the face-to-face -face classroom. And so maintaining that setup online makes the transition easier, I think, on us. So I'm calling this, though, um, these separate containers of peanut butter jelly and, and a slice of dry white bread. <laughs> I'm calling it Online Course Design 1.0. So the problem with this is that it lacks opportunities for active learning. Right, active learning, you guys know when students are engaged, um, they're doing more than just downloading a PowerPoint file and clicking through slides. They are doing things, they're performing tasks, they are contributing to our learning community. And so um, I think in a face-to-face -face class, those kind of active learning moments come spontaneously in the interaction with our students. Whatever it is, that activity, that moment, um, it organically kind of grows out of that moment in the classroom. But um, the problem is that when we move that to face-to-face, -to -face, that spontaneous active learning moment kind of gets unintentionally left behind. Um, it, it leaves our online course, you know, without that, and suddenly we have uninspiring content and sort of an isolating environment. So I, we have to look for ways to explicitly, I think, build active learning into our online courses because we can't rely on that same spontaneity. So, and you saw this one coming, um, the 2.0 of online course design then is this, this ooey gooey, messy and sticky and totally delicious peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, it's the overlap and smushing together of those three things, essentially, a content assessment and interaction. And it's going to, it's going to, that's, I think, and that's kind of what I, this is the image that I have in my head when I'm working with faculty members, is how to smush it all together. Because that's when you get this really sweet and delicious thing. Um, Sam's going to share us with us um, her sweet spot, but I know a lot of folks listening probably have sweet spot <laughs> examples too. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, hopefully we get some ac some activity on Twitter with sweet spots. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's smooshing it all together, and and you'll find I th I think I mean I find that the content suddenly becomes more exciting to our students, um, more relevant to the students when they're participating in it. Having students, you know, be a part of that creation, that uh, curation con uh, process. Um, uh, assessment becomes more valuable to our students as well because it's not just multiple choice A, B, C, D. It's, it's real, um, it closely mimics real life when you're assessing your students uh, in a way that includes interaction. I mean, that's, that's, how, that's how the real world works. So, so I, I mean, there's no clear boundaries here, right? You, at the end of, when I sit down and work with someone, I'm thinking about these things, content and, and, um, and interaction and assessment. It, it, when you're done looking at content and assessment, you shouldn't really have to look at interaction anymore. I don't think interaction should have to be an afterthought of, oh, wait, now I have to design some interaction into my course, too, because that's what's required of me. No. Like, I think if we've done it right, then the interaction is already there, because it's already there in the way that you've put up your content, and it's already there in the way that you're assessing your students. Um, yeah. Uh, that's so, so framework model, I don't know if you really want to call it that. It's just a big beautiful and delicious peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> well, I think it really helps, and I personally think those visuals really um, help a lot, too. Um, and I'm, I'm anxious and also really excited to see, and we get to hear an example of what Sam is doing with her students and kind of take this model and just kind of see it in action and just also hear your experiences, Sam, about, you know, this, we've got this model and let's kind of, let's now put it to the test and 
um, and hear from you, Sam, about how it's playing out in your class. And now you've actually worked with Katie, right? As a oh yes, oh yes. Designer? Okay. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you're going to share with us here. Well, you know, it's interesting as I'm listening to Katie, I'm thinking to to myself that sort of my sweet spot just as a instructor is that I have an instructional designer that I can use to help provide that platform, that unique tool, and then I can take anthropology, which has been the love of my life, and its richness, and put them together. And the one thing about teaching anthropology is that it's not a very good really sit down in a classroom kind of a discipline. It's, it's meant to be active learning and so I find that when I can teach anthropology online I can really provide that active experience in a way that I can't in the classroom as easily. And but but the dilemma for all of us who teach online is finding the right tools, mm -hmm. finding finding the right way for students to manifest their energy and have that teachable moment while they're actually doing it online as well. Right. So and without making the technology overwhelm the learning, finding that balance. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so I tell us about this, yeah this activity. Tell us about your activity. Yeah. Well, I've been in a pretty privileged place because I've had Katie's help all along. And so just this past summer, I said, you know, I need something new. I need something fresh and something that's fun. What can we do? And there is a particular tool within Blackboard that, that we've just started using in the last year, but this was really new for me. I hadn't been using it yet, called Video Everywhere. And it allows students to make videos using their cell phone, using their, or smartphone, using a webcam, or even using a camera that can produce a video. So it gives them a little latitude on how they can actually produce it. And then, in my case, for my anthropology class, I have a series of four video blogs that they do. And uh, the video blog that, that I'm going to be showing today was the second assignment that they used um, or that they had, w that they were s assigned using uh, video everywhere. And it's to describe uh, an experience uh, using non verbal communication. Now in anthropology there's a variety of topics. We just so happen to be talking about the importance of language and culture. But I knew that if we focus the particular assignment on nonverbal language that I'd probably get some very hammy, pretty funny, and very teachable moments by some of my students who I know will be very engaged. So what I asked them to do was to think about a food that they absolutely did not like and to talk about that food using as many nonverbal communication behaviors as they could think of to really stress the emphasis of what they didn't like and why they didn't and then to give me a very short piece at the end describing how natural or unnatural that felt or whether that was actually pretty close to what their own natural pattern of communications is like so maybe if we could show Cassie's video because she's pretty animated Sure, give me one second here. Hi, good morning. I just want to talk to you today about why I'm not ever going to eat beef stroganoff. <laughs> well, the number one reason is that today I am a vegetarian. And the reason is probably most likely due to the fact that my mom used to make us eat beef stroganoff and meatloaf, the two things in the world that I dislike the most. Now, beef stroganoff is disgusting to me because of a few things. <laughs> One is the soggy noodles. My mom used to cook, and she would make the most soggy noodles, overcook them, and it was just gross. It was like eating a slug. And also, I don't like beef. So that's the main ingredient in beef stroganoff. The third reason I'll never eat 
beef stroganoff is because of the gravy-like sauce. Very gross, thick. I'm not sure what is going on there, but that is not happening for me. Now, as you can see, I am one of those people who expresses herself very vividly. I use a lot of facial expressions, and I use my hands a lot. Growing up, I always wondered what you're supposed to do with your hands when you're talking to someone. It's awkward. Should you just have them next to your side, or should you be doing something with them? So I decided I like doing stuff with my hands. It shows people that I'm very alive, and it gives them an expression that I want to. So if I'm sad or if I'm upset, I won't use as many hand signals. I'll just kind of sit there and have a conversation. But when I'm really excited about something, I use my hand expression. All right. We'll talk to you the next time. Bye. That's great. So, Sam, how, um, how cool were your students with doing that right off the bat? Sam, I have you muted. Just click on mute. Yeah, possible. sure. Um, you know, we had some technical problems in the beginning, which made it a bit challenging. Uh, so we, I worked with Katie quite a bit. Um, we, ha we realized we had to switch from using the blog tool in Blackboard to the discussion board. Um, but once the students got the hang of it, they really enjoyed making these videos. And some of them have been amazingly clever. They treat it like a script. They plan out exactly how they're going to start it, how they're going to finish it. They make it like a, a podcast. And so it's been so exciting for me to watch them enjoy learning mm -hmm. by using this particular tool. Uh, th they're actually rather quiet compared to the way Cassie really got into this video. Uh, if you if you in, in, interact with them in other ways, but this they enjoyed, and as you can see, they're not bashful, or at least Cassie certainly isn't. But most of the videos that I took from this particular exercise, they all the students got into it and made the most out of it and had a lot of fun. I think it's yeah. I think it's really useful that your um, learning objectives are directly tied to the verbal, the verbal elements, mm -hmm. right, to the, to the speaking, to what they're yes. doing, because it makes yes. it very relevant to the students, right, the fact that they're leaving the video comments for a particular, a, re a very relevant reason, and I think that that's really, really important. Um, what I'm curious to know, because I use voice um, or video, I give my students a choice in my class using a tool called VoiceThread, um, and, you know, I have found that there's, you know, students don't jump into this like with with like cheerleaders. You know, there's 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 reluctance. Um, we get over that pr pretty significantly when we all do it together in a community, and we start with like really low stakes um, activities. Right. You know, um, so do you experience that reluctance right off the bat? Because we really are when we when we bring students in and say, Hey, guess what? You're going to participate in video. I mean. Yeah. Really, what we're doing is we're shattering their expectations because they're used to discussion boards, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Do you experience right, right. reluctance initially before you get to that sweet spot? What would you say? I, I, I would say I would no. Say no. Quite honestly, Quite honestly um, um, I think I that they're reluctant. Um, hang on, Sam. Is her audio sounding? Yeah. A little bit? Audio went a little weird on us, Sam. Sam, why don't you unplug your USB and? plug it back in and see if that helps because okay, you sound okay. a little robotic on our end and that happens sometimes but that is something that is something that I um, that I do find helps a lot and now we can't hear you you could try just taking out your mic and using if you have a built-in mic you could try that or Sam your settings for your microphone are located in the upper right corner if you look at your screen. Upper right corner, it looks like a flower. Upper right corner, two icons, three icons over from where you would mute your microphone. It looks like a flower. Hmm. Yep. 
So while Sam's trying to get that figure out, I'm going to share her one, one more student video, um, and then we're going to wrap up a few minutes late, but I think that this is a great um, second video to share. We've got one more. And I don't know if I can share this full screen or not. I just had a request for that. So let me see if I can make that happen. I don't I think we tried this and it didn't work when I went full screen. Let's see. That doesn't get any bigger, right? That still looks small to you? Yep, small still. Okay. Hello. Um, I think the food that I would try to avoid would either have to and actually, be not, anything with kidneys or liver in it. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, like these are filter organs. So every everything that animal's body didn't want was filtered out by these organs, and you're eating it. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so disgusting. Um, also, something I would try to avoid um, would probably be pig's blood. Um, there's this Chinese dish where the main ingredient is pig's blood and it's not it's not in liquid form. It's it's hardened to like some jello look at the it looks like tofu almost. It has the texture of tofu. Um, they cut it into the same shape as most tofu that you see. Um, but instead of soybeans it's it's blood. <laughs> <laughs> my my mom always tries to get me to eat that, and I'm like, hey, get that away from me. I don't, I don't know. Just looking at it, it makes me cringe. Um, as far as like using hand gestures, um, I tend not to really move when I'm just you know, normally conversating with people. Um, right now, obviously, I'm trying to force it out. Um, but yeah, normally though, I. I I, mean, I wouldn't say I'm like completely still like a zombie, but um, you know, I, I guess I just don't really move too much, or I'll be like playing with my fingers or something while I'm talking. Um, I know that's probably a bad habit, but you know, it's just something that I do. Or I'll sit there and I'll play with my shirt a lot. Um, I don't know why I do that. It's something that I've just been doing. Um, as far as like physical contact, you know, I, I tend not to really touch people, especially cut, like especially strangers. I mean, my really close friends, yeah, I'll give them like a pat on the back or something. But, um, you know, my mom raised me to, you know, really keep your hands to yourself. And I, I think being from an Asian family, because Asian cultures, they don't really have as much physical contact as we do in the U.S. So I think maybe that has a bit of some kind of rule played out. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that laugh at the end. <laughs> you really get a sense for that student. I mean, you really get, there's no way you can get that in a written out text, uh, you know, discussion board thread. And I bet you get better responses from your other students, you know, more, I mean, I just think it's, it's more uh, uh, authentic the responses that you're probably getting from your other students to that more than, okay, you have two required, you know, replies to the, I don't know, it feels, it feels very real to see them doing that. Right, and you know, one of the things that I enjoy so much is that because the students are really having fun with this, and this was only their second video assignment, but because they're having fun with it, they are spontaneously watching each other's videos and commenting on them yeah, exactly. rather yeah. than rather than for me having to say, would you please look at three people in the yeah. class, look at what they've written, and say something nice to them to support them. I don't do that with this video. Um, and, and this personality that just, I feel like a proud mom. It almost sounds a bit silly. But watching these videos and sharing them with everyone, to see the excitement that they have in doing them, is yeah. thrilling for me because I know the learning is taking place and they're having so much fun doing it that they email me in advance now and ask me, okay, we know we're going to do another video assignment in three weeks, but you haven't said what's it going to be on. What's it going to be on because we want to practice. Mm -hmm. And I've never had any student ever say, let me practice for an assignment. So yeah. this is a great medium. 
it works well in anthropology. I think it would work in many, many other disciplines. But I sort of have the blessing of, you know, great bread, great peanut butter, great jelly, all mushed into one. Yeah, that's a great way to great way to wrap it up. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to to say that there was a, a very interesting study that was just published um, either I think in 2012 by Borup B O R U P Weston Graham. Those are three different authors, and I will try to find the citation, or I don't know if it's available online, but I'll tweet that information. Um, but they actually looked at the use of asynchronous video. They looked at the asynchronous video as feedback in online classes, but also in having students interact that way, and how it increases social presence, which is what we're talking about in terms of yeah. making students feel like they're part of a, a part of a group, um, and how effective that is. And that is a very new space for online research um, because of the tradition that we're coming out of with text-based uh, environments, learning environments. So it's really exciting to start to see these technologies be integrated into the learning management system. And um, I applaud you for taking that risk, Sam, because that is really what it is. It's it is. Risk, it is. That's why, I mean, I love working with instructors like Sam who are willing to take that risk and kind of jump in and try stuff and know that it's going to be messy. It's not going to be mm -hmm. perfect at first. I mean, we had an issue that she mentioned about the blogs not working. We had to switch it to a discussion forum. And, I mean, it's just, you know, there will be those things. So don't expect perfection. We never can with, yeah. with technology. But it all ends up okay, and the students love it, and it, it works. Yeah, so I have um, a question for the, for everyone now. Um, if I can put this on, I don't know if it's going to work. Hang on. But we wrap up our um, Hangouts with what we call a challenge here. And it doesn't look like it's working for me, so I'm going to have to do it verbally. Um, but we have a challenge for you all. We have a challenge for every single Hangout that we do here in the center. And your Hangout, or your center challenge, is to share how you really kind of bring out the sweet spot in online learning. And so after a Hangout, we'd like to have each of you reflect on your own experiences and share back with us. And so if you have your own blog, if you could write a post and just share something that contributes to this idea so that we can all learn more together, you know, learn together more in community, and tweet that a link to that blog post. Um, there we go. Tweet a link to that blog post uh, with the hashtag CCCLearn. That way we'll all be able to kind of follow that feed and learn together. If you're in the Google Plus community, you can post the link there too so it's visible for everyone in the community because some folks in the community aren't on Twitter, so that's a great way to kind of keep it inclusive. Um, and join us for our Twitter chat, our um, Supersizing the Online Learning Sweet Spot Twitter chat on 1031 at 3 p.m. Pacific using the hashtag CCCLearn, and we'll take it one step further and keep learning and sharing more tools and learning activity ideas and so forth, and bring a few friends and mm -hmm. just kind of keep sharing the word. This is going to just keep getting better and better and more exciting. We do have our next Hangout scheduled for Wednesday, November 6th from 4 to 4.30. We're going to be talking about um, teaching with Twitter. So that will be fun, and um, hopefully lots of engaging ideas will come to the surface then, too. Um, it's been great learning with you all. And Katie and Sam, thank you so much for being here. And Sam, sure. say, say thank you to your two fabulous students for sharing with us. It was, it was really generous of them to give their permission to share their comments with everybody. It's, it's great. It's so important to have students be on board with that. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye, everybody.